This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 16 The Place of Death It was already dark on the third day after the scene described in the previous chapter when we camped in some huts at the foot of the Three Witches, as the Triangle of Mountains is called, to which Solomon's Great Road runs. Our party consisted of our three selves and Fulata, who waited on us, especially on good, Infadus, Gagul, who was borne along in a litter, inside which she could be heard muttering and cursing all day long, and a party of guards and attendants. The mountains, or rather the three peaks of the mountain, for the mass was evidently the result of a solitary upheaval, were, as I have said, in the form of a triangle, of which the base was towards us, one peak being on our right, one on our left, and one straight in front of us. Never shall I forget the sight afforded by those three towering peaks in the early sunlight of the following morning. High, high above us, up into the blue air, soared their twisted snow wreaths. Beneath the snow line the peaks were purple with heaths, and so were the wild moors that ran up the slope towards them. Straight before us the white ribbon of Solomon's Great Road stretched away uphill to the foot of the center peak, about five miles from us, and there stopped. It was its terminus. I had better leave the feelings of intense excitement with which we set out on our march that morning to the imagination of those who read this history. At last we were drawing near to the wonderful mines that had been the cause of the miserable death of the old Portuguese Dom three centuries ago, of my poor friend, his ill-starred descendant, and also, as we feared, of George Curtis, Sir Henry's brother. Were we destined, after all that we had gone through, to fare any better? Evil befell them, as that old fiend Gagool said. Would it also befall us? Somehow, as we were marching up that last stretch of beautiful road, I could not help feeling a little superstitious about the matter. And so, I think, did good and Sir Henry. For an hour and a half or more we tramped on up the heather-fringed way, going so fast in our excitement that the bearers of Gagool's hammock could scarcely keep pace with us, and its occupant piped out to us to stop. Walk more slowly, white men, she said, projecting her hideous shriveled countenance between the grass curtains and fixing her gleaming eyes upon us. Why will you run to meet the evil that shall befall you, ye seekers after treasure? And she laughed that horrible laugh which always sent a cold shiver down my back and for a while quite took the enthusiasm out of us. However, on we went, till we saw before us, and between ourselves and the peak, a vast circular hole with sloping sides, three hundred feet or more in depth, and quite half a mile around. "'Can't you guess what this is?' I said to Sir Henry and Good, who were staring in astonishment at the awful pit before us. They shook their heads. "'Then it is clear that you have never seen the diamond diggings at Kimberley. "'You may depend on it that this is Solomon's diamond mine, "'pointing to the strata of stiff blue clay "'which were yet to be seen among the grass and bushes "'that clothed the sides of the pit. "'The formation is the same. "'I'll be bound that if we went down there "'we should find pipes of soapy, brecciated rock. "'Look, too.' and I pointed to a series of worn flat slabs of stone that were placed on a gentle slope below the level of a watercourse, which in some past age had been cut out of the solid rock. If those are not tables once used to wash the stuff, I'm a Dutchman. 
At the edge of this vast hole, which was none other than the pit marked on the old Dom's map, the great road branched into two and circumvented it. In many places, by the way, this surrounding road was built entirely out of blocks of stone, apparently with the object of supporting the edges of the pit and preventing falls of reef. Along this path we pressed, driven by curiosity to see what were the three towering objects which we could discern from the hither side of the great gulf. As we drew near we perceived that they were colossi of some sort or another, and rightly conjectured that before us sat the three silent ones that are held in such awe by the Kukuana people. But it was not until we were quite close to them that we recognized the full majesty of these silent ones. There, upon huge pedestals of dark rock, sculptured with rude emblems of the phallic worship, separated from each other by a distance of forty paces, and looking down the road which crossed some sixty miles of plain to Loo, were three colossal seated forms, two male and one female, each measuring about thirty feet from the crown of its head to the pedestal. The female form, which was nude, was of great though severe beauty, but unfortunately the features had been injured by centuries of exposure to the weather. Rising from either side of her head were the points of a crescent. The two male colossi, on the contrary, were draped and presented a terrifying cast of features, especially the one to our right, which had the face of a devil. That to our left was serene in countenance, but the calm upon it seemed dreadful. It was the calm of that inhuman cruelty, Sir Henry remarked, which the ancients attributed to being potent for good, who could yet watch the sufferings of humanity, if not without rejoicing, at least without sorrow. These three statues form a most awe-inspiring trinity, as they sit there in their solitude and gaze out across the plain forever. Contemplating these silent ones, as the Kukuanas call them, an intense curiosity again seized us to know whose were the hands which had shaped them. Who was it that had dug the pit and made the road? Whilst I was gazing and wondering, suddenly it occurred to me, being familiar with the Old Testament, that Solomon went astray after strange gods, the names of three of whom I remembered, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon. And I suggested to my companions that the figures before us might represent these false and exploded divinities. Hmm said Sir Henry, who is a scholar, having taken a high degree in classics at college. There may be something in that. Ashtoreth of the Hebrews was the Astarte of the Phoenicians, who were the great traders of Solomon's time. Astarte, who afterwards became the Aphrodite of the Greeks, was represented with horns like the half-moon, and there on the brow of the female figure are distinct horns. Perhaps these colossi were designed by some Phoenician official who managed the mines. Who can say? Note, compare Milton, Paradise Lost, Book One. With these in troop came Ashtoreth, whom the Phoenicians called Astarte, Queen of Heaven with crescent horns to whose bright image nightly by the moon Sidonian virgins paid their vows and songs. Before we had finished examining these extraordinary relics of remote antiquity, Infarus came up, and having saluted the silent ones by lifting his spear, asked us if we intended entering the place of death at once, or if we would wait till after we had taken food at midday. If we were ready to go at once, Gagool had announced her willingness to guide us. As it was not later than eleven o'clock, driven to it by a burning curiosity, 
we announced our intention of proceeding instantly, and I suggested that, in case we should be detained in the cave, we should take some food with us. Accordingly, Gagool's litter was brought up, and that lady herself assisted out of it. Meanwhile, Fulata, at my request, stored some biltong, or dried game flesh, together with a couple of gourds of water, in a reed basket with a hinged cover. Straight in front of us, at a distance of some fifty paces from the backs of the colossi, rose a sheer wall of rock, eighty feet or more in height, that gradually sloped upwards till it formed the base of the lofty, snow-wreathed peak, which soared into the air three thousand feet above us. As soon as she was clear of her hammock, Gagool cast one evil grin upon us, and then, leaning on a stick, hobbled off towards the face of this wall. We followed her till we came to a narrow portal, solidly arched, that looked like the opening of a gallery of a mine. Here Gagool was waiting for us, still with that evil grin upon her horrid face. "'Now, white men from the stars,' she piped, "'great warriors, Inkibu, Buguan, and Makumazan the wise. "'Are you ready? "'Behold, I am here to do the bidding of my lord the king, "'and to show you the store of bright stones.' <laughs> "'We are ready,' I said. "'Good, good, make strong your hearts to bear what ye shall see.' Comest thou too, Infidus, thou who didst betray thy master? Infidus frowned as he answered, Nay, I come not, it is not for me to enter there. But thou, Gagool, curb thy tongue, and beware how thou dealest with my lords. At thy hands will I require them, and if a hair of them be hurt, Gagool, Beest thou fifty times a witch, thou shalt die, hearest thou? I hear, Infadus, I know thee, thou did ever love big words. When thou was a babe, I remember, thou did threaten thine own mother. That was but the other day. But fear not, fear not, I live only to do the bidding of the king. I have done the bidding of many kings in Fadus, till in the end they did mine. <laughs> I go to look upon their faces once more, and Twala's also. Come on, come on, here is the lamp. And she drew a large gourd full of oil, and fitted with a rush wick from under her fur cloak. Art thou coming, Fulata? In his villainous kitchen kukuana, in which he had been improving himself under that young lady's tuition. I fear, my lord, the girl answered timidly. Then give me the basket. Nay, my lord, whither thou goest, there I go also. The deuce you will, thought I to myself. That may be rather awkward if we ever get out of this. Without further ado, Gagool plunged into the passage, which was wide enough to admit of two walking abreast, and quite dark. We followed the sound of her voice as she piped to us to come on, in some fear and trembling, which was not allayed by the flutter of a sudden rush of wings. Hello, what's that? Hallowed Good. "'Somebody hit me in the face!' "'Bats,' said I. "'On you go.' "'When, so far as we could judge, "'we had gone some fifty paces, "'we perceived that the passage was growing faintly light. "'Another minute, and we were in perhaps the most wonderful place "'that the eyes of living man have beheld. "'Let the reader picture to himself the hall of the vastest cathedral he ever stood in, windowless indeed, but dimly lighted from above, presumably by shafts connected with the outer air, and driven in the roof, 
which arched away a hundred feet above our heads, and he will get some idea of the size of the enormous cave in which we found ourselves, with the difference that this cathedral designed by nature was loftier and wider than any built by man. But its stupendous size was the least of the wonders of the place, for running in rows down its length were gigantic pillars of what looked like ice, but were in reality huge stalactites. It is impossible for me to convey any idea of the overpowering beauty and grandeur of these pillars of white spar, some of which were not less than twenty feet in diameter at the base, and sprang up in lofty and yet delicate beauty sheer to the distant roof. Others, again, were in process of formation. On the rock floor there was in these cases what looked, Sir Henry said, exactly like a broken column in an old Grecian temple, whilst high above, depending from the roof, the point of a huge icicle could be dimly seen. Even as we gazed we could hear the process going on, for presently with a tiny splash a drop of water would fall from the far-off icicle onto the column below. On some columns the drops only fell once in two or three minutes, and in these cases it would be an interesting calculation to discover how long, at that rate of dripping, it would take to form a pillar, say, eighty feet by ten in diameter. That the process, in at least one instance, was incalculably slow. The following example will suffice to show. Cut on one of these pillars, we discovered the crude likeness of a mummy, by the head of which sat what appeared to be the figure of an Egyptian god, doubtless the handiwork of some old-world laborer in the mine. This work of art was executed at the natural height at which an idle fellow be he Phoenician workman or British cad, is in the habit of trying to immortalize himself at the expense of nature's masterpieces, namely about five feet from the ground. Yet at the time that we saw it, which must have been nearly three thousand years after the date of the execution of the carving, the column was only eight feet high and was still in process of formation which gives a rate of growth of a foot to a thousand years, or an inch and a fraction to a century. This we knew because, as we were standing by it, we heard a drop of water fall. Sometimes the stalagmites took strange forms, presumably where the dropping of the water had not always been on the same spot. Thus one huge mass, which must have weighed a hundred tons or so, was in the shape of a pulpit, beautifully fretted over outside with a design that looked like lace. Others resembled strange beasts, and on the sides of the cave were fan-like ivory tracings, such as the frost leaves upon a pane. Out of the vast main aisle there opened here and there smaller caves, exactly, Sir Henry said, as chapels, open out of great cathedrals. Some were large, but one or two, and this is a wonderful instance of how nature carries out her handiwork by the same unvarying laws, utterly irrespective of size, were tiny. One little nook, for instance, was no larger than an unusually big doll's house, and yet it might have been a model for the whole place, for the water dropped, tiny icicles hung, and spar columns were forming in just the same way. We had not, however, enough time to examine this beautiful cavern so thoroughly as we should have liked to do, since unfortunately Gagool seemed to be indifferent as to stalactites and only anxious to get her business over. This annoyed me the more, as I was particularly anxious to discover if possible, by what system the light was admitted into the cave, and whether it was done by the hand of man or by that of nature that this was done. 
Also, if the place had been used in any way in ancient times, as seemed probable. However, we consoled ourselves with the idea that we would investigate it thoroughly on our way back, and followed on at the heels of our uncanny guide. On she led us, straight to the top of the vast and silent cave, where we found another doorway, not arched as the first was, but square at the top, something like the doorways of Egyptian temples. "'Are ye prepared to enter the place of death, white men?' asked Gagool, evidently with a view to making us feel uncomfortable. "'Lead on, Macduff,' said Good solemnly, trying to look as though he was not at all alarmed, as indeed we all did except Fulata, who caught Good by the arm for protection. "'This is getting rather ghastly,' said Sir Henry, peeping into the dark passageway. "'Come on, Quartermain, Signoris Prioress. "'We mustn't keep the old lady waiting.' "'And he politely made way for me to lead the van, "'for which inwardly I did not bless him. "'Tap, tap,' went old Gagool's stick down the passage, "'as she trotted along, chuckling hideously.' and still overcome by some unaccountable presentiment of evil, I hung back. "'Come get on, old fellow,' said Good, "'or we shall lose our fair guide.' Thus adjured, I started down the passage, and after about twenty paces found myself in a gloomy apartment some forty feet long by thirty broad and thirty high, which in some past age evidently had been hollowed by hand labor out of the mountain. This apartment was not nearly so well lighted as the vast stalactite anti-cave, and at the first glance all I could discern was a massive stone table running down its length, with a colossal white figure at its head, and life-sized white figures all round it. Next I discovered a brown thing, seated on the table in the center, and in another moment my eyes grew accustomed to the light, and I saw what all these things were, and was tailing out of the place as hard as my legs could carry me. I am not a nervous man in the general way, and very little troubled with superstitions, of which I have lived to see the folly, but I am free to own that this sight quite upset me, and had it not been that Sir Henry caught me by the collar and held me, I do honestly believe that in another five minutes I should have been outside the stalactite cave, and that a promise of all the diamonds in Kimberley would not have induced me to enter it again. But he held me tight, so I stopped because I could not help myself. Next second, however, his eyes became accustomed to the light, and he let go of me, and began to mop the perspiration off his forehead. As for good, he swore feebly, while Fulata threw her arms around his neck and shrieked. Only Gagool chuckled loud and long. It was a ghastly sight. There at the end of the long stone table, holding in his skeleton fingers a great white spear, sat death himself, draped in the form of a colossal human skeleton, fifteen feet or more in height. High above his head he held the spear, as though in the act to strike. One bony hand rested on the stone table before him, in the position a man assumes on rising from his seat, whilst his frame was bent forward so that the vertebrae of the neck and the grinning, gleaming skull projected towards us, and fixed its hollow eye-places upon us, the jaws a little open, as though it were about to speak. "'Great heavens!' said I faintly at last. "'What can it be?' "'And what are those things?' asked Good, pointing to the white company round the table. "'And what on earth is that thing?' said Sir Henry, pointing to the brown creature seated on the table. "'He, <laughs> laughed Gagool. "'To those who enter the hall of the dead, evil comes. "'He, <laughs> ha, 
Come, Inkiboo, brave in battle, come and see him thou slewest. And the old creature caught Curtis's coat in her skinny fingers and led him towards the table. We followed. Presently she stopped and pointed at the brown object seated on the table. Sir Henry looked and started back with an exclamation, and no wonder, for there, quite naked, the head which Curtis's battle-axe had shorn from the body resting on its knees was the gaunt corpse of Twala, the last king of the Kukuanas. Yes, there, the head perched upon the knees, it sat in all its ugliness, the vertebrae projecting a full inch above the level of the shrunken flesh of the neck, for all the world like a black double of Hamilton to gay. Now haste ye, my handmaidens, haste and see how he sits there and glowers with his head on his knee. Over the surface of the corpse there was gathered a thin glassy film that made its appearance yet more appalling, for which we were at the moment quite unable to account. Till presently we observed that from the roof of the chamber the water fell steadily, drip, drop, drip, on to the neck of the corpse, whence it ran down over the entire surface, and finally escaped into the rock through a tiny hole in the table. Then I guessed what the film was. Twala's body was being transformed into a stalactite. A look at the white forms seated on the stone bench which ran round that ghastly board confirmed this view. They were human bodies indeed, or rather they had been human. Now they were stalactites. This was the way in which the Kukuana people had, from time immemorial, preserved their royal dead. They petrified them. What the exact system might be, if there was any, beyond the placing of them for a long period of years under the drip, I never discovered but there they sat, iced over and preserved forever by the silicious fluid. Anything more awe-inspiring than the spectacle of this long line of departed royalties, there were twenty-seven of them, the last being Ignosi's father, wrapped each of them in a shroud of ice-like spar, through which the features could be dimly discovered and seated round that inhospitable board with death himself for a host, it is impossible to imagine. That the practice of thus preserving their kings must have been an ancient one is evident from the number, which, allowing for an average reign of fifteen years, supposing that every king who reigned was placed here, an improbable thing is some are sure to have perished in battle far from home, would fix the date of its commencement at four and a quarter centuries back. But the colossal death who sits at the head of this board is far older than that, and, unless I am mistaken, owes his origin to the same artist who designed the three colossi. He is hewn out of a single stalactite, and looked at as a work of art, is most admirably conceived and executed. Good, who understands such things, declared that, so far as he could see, the anatomical design of the skeleton is perfect down to the smallest bones. My own idea is that this terrific object was a freak of fancy on the part of some old-world sculptor, and that its presence had suggested to the Kukuanas the idea of placing their royal dead under its awful presidency. Or perhaps it was set there to frighten away any marauders who might have designs upon the treasure chamber beyond. I cannot say. All I can do is describe it as it is, and the reader must form his own conclusion. Such, at any rate, was the white death and such were the white dead. End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 17 Solomon's Treasure Chamber While we were engaged in recovering from our fright and in examining the grisly wonders of the place of death, Gagool had been differently occupied. Somehow or other, for she was marvelously active when she chose, she had scrambled onto the great table and made her way to where our departed friend Twala was placed, under the drip, to see suggested good how he was pickling, or for some dark purpose of her own. Then, after bending down to kiss his icy lips as though in affectionate greeting, she hobbled back, stopping now and again to address the remark, the tenor of which I could not catch, to one or other of the shrouded forms, just as you or I might welcome an old acquaintance. Having gone through this mysterious and horrible ceremony, she squatted herself down on the table immediately under the white death, and began, so far as I could make out, to offer up prayers. The spectacle of this wicked creature pouring out supplications, evil ones, no doubt, to the arch-enemy of mankind, was so uncanny that it caused us to hasten our inspection. "'Now, Gagool,' said I, in a low voice, somehow one did not dare to speak above a whisper in that place, "'Lead us to the chamber.' "'The old witch promptly scrambled down from the table. "'My lords are not afraid,' she said, leering up into my face. "'Lead on.' "'Good, my lords,' and she hobbled round to the back of the great death. "'Here is the chamber. Let my lords light the lamp and enter.' and she placed the gourd full of oil upon the floor, and leaned herself against the side of the cave. I took out a match, of which we still had a few in a box, and lit a rush wick, and then looked for the doorway, but there was nothing before us except the solid rock. Gagool grinned. The way is there, my lords. <laughs> Do not jest with us. I said sternly. I just not, my lord, see, and she pointed at the rock. As she did so, on holding up the lamp, we perceived that a mass of stone was rising slowly from the floor and vanishing into the rock above, where doubtless there is a good cavity prepared to receive it. The mass was of the width of a good-sized door, about ten feet high and not less than five feet thick. It must have weighed at least twenty or thirty tons, and was clearly moved upon some simple balance principle of counterweights, probably the same as that by which the opening and shutting of an ordinary modern window is arranged. How the principle was set in motion, of course, none of us saw. Gagool was careful to avoid this, but I have little doubt that there was some very simple lever, which was moved ever so little by pressure at a secret spot, thereby throwing additional weight onto the hidden counterbalances and causing the monolith to be lifted from the ground. Very slowly and gently the great stone raised itself, till at last it had vanished altogether, and a dark hole presented itself to us in the place which the door had filled. Our excitement was so intense as we saw the way to Solomon's treasure chamber thrown open at last that I, for one, began to tremble and shake. Would it prove a hoax after all, I wondered? Or was old Da Silvestra right? Were there vast hordes of wealth hidden in that dark place? Hordes which would make us the richest men in the whole world, we should know in a minute or two. 
enter, white men from the stars, said Gagool, advancing into the doorway. But first, hear your servant, Gagool the Old. The bright stones that ye will see were dug out of the pit over which the silent ones are set, and stored here, I know not by whom, for that was done longer ago than even I remember. But once has this place been entered since the time that those who hid the stones departed in haste, leaving them behind. The report of the treasure went down indeed among the people who lived in the country from age to age, but none knew where the chamber was, nor the secret of the door. But it happened that a white man reached this country from over the mountains. Perchance he too came from the stars, and was well received by the king of that day. He it is who sits yonder, and she pointed to the fifth king at the table of the dead. And it came to pass that he and a woman of the country who was with him journeyed to this place, and that by chance the woman learnt the secret of the door. A thousand years might ye search, but ye should never find that secret. Then the white man entered with the woman and found the stones, and filled with stones the skin of a small goat which the woman had with her to hold food. And as he was going from the chamber he took up one more stone, a large one, and held it in his hand. Here she paused. Well, I asked, breathless with interest, as we all were, what happened to Da Silvestra? The old hag started at the mention of his name. How knowest thou the dead man's name? she asked sharply, and then without waiting for an answer went on. None can tell what happened, but it came about that the white man was frightened for he flung down the goatskin with the stones and fled out with only the one stone in his hand. And that the king took, and it is the stone which thou, Makumazan, didst take from Twala's brow. Have none entered here since? I asked, peering again down the dark passage. None, my lords. Only the secret of the door has been kept, and every king has opened it, though he has not entered. There is a saying, that those who enter there will die within a moon, even as the white man died in the cave upon the mountain where ye found him, Makumazan, and therefore the kings do not enter. Ha <laughs> ha! Mine are true words! Our eyes met as she said it, and I turned sick and cold. How did the old hag know all these things? Enter, my lords. If I speak truth, the goatskin with the stones will lie upon the floor. And if there is truth as to whether it is death to enter here, that ye will learn afterwards. Ha, ha, ha! and she hobbled through the doorway, bearing the light with her. But I confess that once more I hesitated about following. Oh, confound it all, said Good. Here goes. I am not going to be frightened by that old devil. And followed by Fulata, who, however, evidently did not at all like the business, for she was shivering with fear. He plunged into the passage after Gagool, an example which we quickly followed. A few yards down the passage, in the narrow way hewn out of the living rock, Gagool had paused and was waiting for us. See, my lords, she said, holding the light before her. Those who stored the treasure here fled in haste and bethought them to guard against any who should find the secret of the door, but had not the time, and she pointed to the large square blocks of stone, which to the height of two courses, about two feet three, 
had been placed across the passage with a view to walling it up. Along the side of the passage were similar blocks ready for use, and, most curious of all, a heap of mortar and a couple of trowels, which tools, so far as we had time to examine them, appeared to be of a similar shape and make to those used by workmen to this day. Here Fulata, who had been in a state of great fear and agitation throughout, said that she felt faint and could go no farther, but would wait there. Accordingly, we sat her down on the unfinished wall, placing the basket of provisions by her side, and left her to recover. Following the passage for about fifteen paces farther, we came suddenly to an elaborately painted wooden door. It was standing wide open. Whoever was last there had either not found the time to shut it, or had forgotten to do so. Across the threshold of this door lay a skin bag, formed of a goat skin, that appeared to be full of pebbles. He <laughs> he, white men, sniggered Gagool, as the light from the lamp fell upon it. What did I tell you that the white man who came here fled in haste and dropped the woman's bag? Behold it, look within also, and ye will find a water gourd amongst the stones. Good stooped down and lifted it. It was heavy and jingled. By Jove, I believe it's full of diamonds, he said in an awed whisper. And indeed, the idea of a small goat skin full of diamonds is enough to awe anybody. Go on, said Sir Henry impatiently. Here, old lady, give me the lamp. And taking it from Gagool's hand, he stepped through the doorway and held it high above his head. We pressed in after him, forgetful for the moment of the bag of diamonds, and found ourselves in King Solomon's treasure chamber. At first, all that the somewhat faint light given by the lamp revealed was a room hewn out of the living rock, and apparently not more than ten feet square. Next there came into sight, stored one on the other to the arch of the roof, a splendid collection of elephant tusks. How many of them there were we did not know, for of course we could not see to what depth they went but there could not have been less than the ends of four or five hundred tusks of the first quality, visible to our eyes. There alone was enough ivory to make a man wealthy for life. Perhaps, I thought, it was from this very store that Solomon drew the raw material for his great throne of ivory, of which there was not the like made in any kingdom. On the opposite side of the chamber were about a score of wooden boxes, something like Martini Henry ammunition boxes, only rather larger and painted red. There are the diamonds, cried I. Bring the light. Sir Henry did so, holding it close to the top box, of which the lid, rendered rotten by time even in that dry place, appeared to have been smashed in probably by da Silvestra himself. Pushing my hand through the hole in the lid, I drew it out full, not of diamonds, but of gold pieces, of a shape that none of us had seen before, and with what looked like Hebrew characters stamped upon them. Ah, I said, replacing the coin. We shan't go back empty-handed, anyhow. There must be a couple of thousand pieces in each box, and there are eighteen boxes. I suppose this was the money to pay the workmen and merchants. Well, put in good, I think that is the lot. I don't see any diamonds unless the old Portuguese put them all into his bag. Let my lords look yonder where it is darkest, if they would find the stones, said Gagool, interpreting our looks. There, my lords, will find a nook, and three stone chests in the nook, two sealed and one open. 
before translating this to Sir Henry, who carried the light, I could not resist asking how she knew these things if no one had entered the place since the white man generations ago. Amakumazan, the watcher by night, was the mocking answer. Ye who dwell in the stars, do ye not know that some live long, and that some have eyes which can see through rock? Ha, ha, ha! Look in that corner, Curtis, I said, indicating the spot Gagool had pointed out. Hello, you fellows, he cried. Here's a recess. Great heavens, see here. We hurried up to where he was standing in a nook, shaped something like a small bow window. Against the wall of this recess were placed three stone chests, each about two feet square. Two were fitted with stone lids. The lid of the third rested against the side of the chest, which was open. See, he repeated hoarsely, holding the lamp over the open chest. We looked and for a moment could make nothing out, on account of a silvery sheen which dazzled us. When our eyes grew used to it, we saw that the chest was three parts full of uncut diamonds, most of them of considerable size. Stooping, I picked some up. Yes, there was no doubt of it. There was the unmistakable soapy feel about them. I fairly gasped as I dropped them. We are the richest men in the whole world, I said. Monte Cristo was a fool to us. We shall flood the market with diamonds, said Good. Got to get them there first, suggested Sir Henry. We stood still with pale faces and stared at each other, the lantern in the middle and the glittering gems below, as though we were conspirators about to commit a crime instead of being, as we thought, the most fortunate men on earth. He 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 cackled old Gagool behind us, as she flitted about like a vampire bat. There are the bright stones ye love, white men. As many as ye will, take them. Run them through your fingers. Eat of them. He <laughs> he drink of them. Ha <laughs> ha. At that moment there was something so ridiculous to my mind at the idea of eating and drinking diamonds that I began to laugh outrageously, an example which the others followed without knowing why. There we stood and shrieked with laughter over the gems that were ours, which had been found for us thousands of years ago by the patient delvers in the great hole yonder, and stored for us by Solomon's long-dead overseer, whose name, perchance, was written in the characters stamped on the faded wax that yet adhered to the lids of the chest. Solomon never got them, nor David, or Da Silvestra, nor anybody else. We had got them. There before us were millions of pounds worth of diamonds, and thousands of pounds worth of gold and ivory only waiting to be taken away. Suddenly the fit passed off, and we stopped laughing. "'Open the other chests, white men,' croaked Gagool. "'There are surely more therein. Take your fill, white lords. Ha, ha! Take your fill!' Thus adjured, we set to work to pull up the stone lids on the other two. First, not without a feeling of sacrilege, "'breaking the seals that fastened them. "'Hurrah! They were full, too, full to the brim. "'At least the second one was. "'No wretched burglarious da Silvestra "'had been filling goatskins out of that. "'As for the third chest, it was only about a fourth full, "'but the stones were all picked ones, "'none less than twenty carats, "'and some of them as large as pigeon eggs.' A good many of these bigger ones, however, we could see by holding them up to the light, were a little yellow, off-colored, as they call it at Kimberley. What we did not see, however, was the look of fearful malevolence that old Gagool favored us with as she crept, crept like a snake, out of the treasure chamber 
and down the passage towards the door of solid rock. Hark! Cry upon cry comes ringing up the vaulted path. It is Fulata's voice. Oh, Bugwan, help! Help! The stone falls! Leave go, girl, then. Help! Help! She has stabbed me! By now we are running down the passage, and this is what the light from the lamp shows us. The door of the rock is closing down slowly. It is not three feet from the floor. Near it struggle Fulata and Gagool. The red blood of the former runs to her knee, but still the brave girl holds the old witch who fights like a wild cat. Ah, she is free. Fulata falls, and Gagool throws herself on the ground to twist like a snake through the crack of the closing stone. She is under. Ah, God, too late, too late. The stone nips her, and she yells in agony. Down, down it comes, all the thirty tons of it, slowly pressing her old body against the rock below. Shriek upon shriek, such as we have never heard. Then a long, sickening crunch, and the door was shut, just as, rushing down the passage, we hurled ourselves against it. It was all done in four seconds. Then we turned to Fulata. The poor girl was stabbed in the body, and I saw that she could not live long. Ah, Bugwan, I die, gasped the beautiful creature. She crept out, Gagul. I did not see her. I was faint, and the door began to fall. Then she came back and was looking up the path. I saw her come in through the slowly falling door and caught her and held her, and she stabbed me, and I die, Bugwan. Poor girl, poor girl, Good cried in his distress. And then, as he could do nothing else, he fell to kissing her. Bugwan, she said after a pause, is Makumazan there? It grows so dark, I cannot see. Here I am, Fulata. Makumazan, be my tongue for a moment. I pray thee, for Bugwan cannot understand me. And before I go into the darkness, I would speak to him a word. Say on, Fulata, I will render it. Say to my lord, Bugwan, that I love him, and that I am glad to die, because I know that he cannot cumber his life with such as I am. For the sun may not mate with the darkness nor the white with the black. Say that since I saw him, at times I have felt as though there were a bird in my bosom, which would one day fly hence and sing elsewhere. Even now, though I cannot lift my hand and my brain grows cold, I do not feel as though my heart were dying. It is so full of love that it could live ten thousand years and yet be young. Say that if I live again, mayhap I shall see him in the stars, and that I will search them all, though perchance there I should still be black and he would still be white. Say, nay, Macumazan, say no more. Save that I love. Oh, hold me closer, Bugwan. I cannot feel thine arms. Chee, chee. She is dead. She is dead, muttered Good, rising in grief, the tears running down his honest face. You need not let that trouble you, old fellow, said Sir Henry. 
Eh? exclaimed Good. What do you mean? I mean that you will soon be in a position to join her. Man, don't you see that we are buried alive? Until Sir Henry uttered these words, I do not think that the full horror of what had happened had come home to us, preoccupied as we were with the sight of poor Fulata's end. But now we understood. The ponderous mass of rock had closed, probably forever, for the only brain which knew its secret was crushed to powder beneath its weight. This was a door that none could hope to force with anything short of dynamite in large quantities, and we were on the wrong side. For a few minutes we stood horrified there over the corpse of Fulata. All the manhood seemed to have gone out of us. The first shock of this idea of the slow and miserable end that awaited us was overpowering. We saw it all now. That fiend Gagool had planned this snare for us from the first. It would have been just the jest that her evil mind would have rejoiced in, the idea of the three white men, whom for some reason of her own she had always hated, slowly perishing of thirst and hunger in the company of the treasure they had coveted. Now I saw the point of that sneer of hers about eating and drinking the diamonds. Probably somebody had tried to serve the poor old Dom in the same way when he abandoned the skin full of jewels. This will never do, said Sir Henry hoarsely. The lamp will soon go out. Let us see if we can't find the spring that works the rock. We sprang forward with desperate energy, and standing in a bloody ooze began to feel up and down the door and the sides of the passage. But no knob or spring could we discover. Depend on it, I said, it does not work from the inside. If it did, Gagool would not have risked trying to crawl underneath the stone. It was the knowledge of this that made her try to escape at all hazards, curse her. At all events, said Sir Henry with a hard little laugh, retribution was swift. Hers was almost as awful an end as ours is likely to be. We can do nothing with the door. Let us go back to the treasure room. We turned and went. And as we passed it, I perceived by the unfinished wall across the passage the basket of food which poor Fulata had carried. I took it up and brought it with me to the accursed treasure chamber that was to be our grave. Then we returned and reverently bore in Fulata's corpse, laying it on the floor by the boxes of coin. Next we seated ourselves, leaning our backs against the three stone chests which contained the priceless treasure. Let us divide the food, said Sir Henry, so as to make it last as long as possible. Accordingly we did so. It would, we reckoned, make four infinitesimally small meals for each of us, enough, say, to support life for a couple of days. Besides the biltong, or dried game flesh, there were two gourds of water, each of which held not more than a quart. Now, said Sir Henry grimly, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We each ate a small portion of the biltong and drank a sip of water. Needless to say, we had but little appetite, though we were sadly in need of food, and felt better after swallowing it. Then we got up and made a systematic examination of the walls of our prison house in the faint hope of finding some means of exit, sounding them and the floor carefully. There was none. It was not probable that there would be any to a treasure chamber. The lamp began to burn dim. 
the fat was nearly exhausted. Quartermain, said Sir Henry, what is the time? Your watch goes? I drew it out and looked at it. It was six o'clock. We had entered the cave at eleven. Infadus will miss us, I suggested. If we do not return tonight, he will search for us in the morning, Curtis. He may search in vain. He does not know the secret of the door, nor even where it is. No living person knew it yesterday except Gagool. Today no one knows it. Even if he found the door, he could not break it down. All the Kukuana army could not break through five feet of living rock. My friends, I see nothing for it but to bow ourselves to the will of the Almighty. The search for treasure has brought many to a bad end. We shall go to swell their number. The lamp grew dimmer yet. Presently it flared up and showed the whole scene in strong relief. The great mass of white tusks, the boxes of gold, the corpse of the poor Fulata stretched before them, the goatskin full of treasure, the dim glimmer of the diamonds, and the wild, wan faces of us three white men seated there awaiting death by starvation. Then the flame sank and expired. End of chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 18 We Abandon Hope I can give no adequate description of the horrors of the night which followed. Mercifully, they were to some extent mitigated by sleep, for even in such a position as ours, wearied nature will sometimes assert itself. But I, at any rate, found it impossible to sleep much. Putting aside the terrifying thought of our impending doom, for the bravest man on earth might well quail from such a fate as awaited us, and I never made any pretensions to be brave. The silence itself was too great to allow of it. Reader, you may have lain awake at night and thought the quiet oppressive, but I say with confidence that you can have no idea what a vivid, tangible thing is perfect stillness. On the surface of the earth there is always some sound or motion, and though it may in itself be imperceptible, yet it deadens the sharp edge of absolute silence. But here there was none. We were buried in the bowels of a huge snow-clad peak. Thousands of feet above us the fresh air rushed over the white snow, but no sound of it reached us. We were separated by a long tunnel and five feet of rock, even from the awful chamber of the dead. And the dead make no noise. Did we not know it who lay by poor Fulata's side? The crashing of all the artillery of earth and heaven could not have come to our ears in our living tomb. We were cut off from every echo of the world. We were as men already in the grave. Then the irony of the situation forced itself upon me. There around us lay treasures enough to pay off a moderate national debt or to build a fleet of ironclads, and yet we would have bartered them all gladly for the faintest chance of escape. Soon, doubtless, we would be rejoiced to exchange them for a bite of food or a cup of water and after that even for the privilege of a speedy close to our sufferings. Truly wealth, which men spend their lives in acquiring, is a valueless thing at the last. And so the night wore on. Good, said Sir Henry's voice at last, and it sounded awful in the intense stillness. How many matches have you in the box? Eight, Curtis. 
Strike one, then, and let us see the time. He did so, and in contrast to the dense darkness, the flame nearly blinded us. It was five o'clock by my watch. The beautiful dawn was now blushing on the snow wreaths far over our heads, and the breeze would be stirring the night mists in the hollows. We had better eat something and keep up our strength, I suggested. What is the good of eating, answered Good. The sooner we die and get it over with, the better. While there is life, there is hope said Sir Henry. Accordingly, we ate and sipped some water, and another period of time elapsed. Then Sir Henry suggested that it might be well to get as near the door as possible, and hallo, on the faint chance of somebody catching a sound outside. Accordingly, Good, who from long practice at sea has a fine piercing note, groped his way down the passage and set to work. I must say that he made a most diabolical noise. I never heard such yells, but it might have been a mosquito buzzing for all the effect they produced. After a while he gave it up and came back very thirsty and had to drink. Then we stopped yelling as it encroached on the supply of water. So we sat down once more against the chests of useless diamonds in that dreaded inaction, which is one of the hardest circumstances of our fate, and I am bound to say that, for my part, I gave way in despair. Laying my head against Sir Henry's broad shoulder, I burst into tears, and I think that I heard Good gulping away on the other side, and swearing hoarsely at himself for doing it. Ah, how good and brave that great man was! Had we been two frightened children, and he our nurse, he could not have treated us more tenderly. Forgetting his own share of miseries, he did all he could to soothe our broken nerves, telling stories of men who had been in somewhat similar circumstances and miraculously escaped. And when these failed to cheer us, pointing out how, after all, it was only anticipating an end which must come to us all, that it would soon be over, and that death from exhaustion was a merciful one, which is not true. Then, in a diffident sort of way, as once before I had heard him do, he suggested that we should throw ourselves on the mercy of a higher power, which for my part I did with great vigor. His is a beautiful character, very quiet, but very strong. And so somehow the day went as the night had gone, if indeed one can use these terms when all was densest night. And when I lit a match to see the time, it was seven o'clock. Once more we ate and drank, and as we did so, an idea occurred to me. How is it, said I, that the air in this place keeps fresh? It is thick and heavy, but it is perfectly fresh. Good heavens, said Good, starting up. I never thought of that. It can't come through the stone door, for it's airtight, if ever a door was. It must come from somewhere. If there were no current of air in the place, we should have been stifled or poisoned when we first came in. Let us have a look. It was wonderful what a change this mere spark of hope wrought in us. In a moment we were all three groping about on our hands and knees, feeling for the slightest indication of a draft. Presently my ardor received a check. I put my hand on something cold. It was dead Fulata's face. For an hour or more we went on feeling about, till at last Sir Henry and I gave it up in despair, having been considerably hurt by constantly knocking our heads against tusks, chests, and the sides of the chamber. But Good still persevered, saying, with an approach to cheerfulness, that it was better than doing nothing. "'I say, you fellows,' 
he said presently, in a constrained sort of voice. Come here. Needless to say, we scrambled towards him quickly enough. Quatermain, put your hand here where mine is. Now, do you feel anything? I think I feel air coming up. Now listen. He rose and stamped upon the place, and a flame of hope shot up in our hearts. It rang hollow. With trembling hands I lit a match. I had only three left, and we saw we were in the angle of the far corner of the chamber, a fact that accounted for our not having noticed the hollow sound of the place during our former exhaustive examination. As the match burnt, we scrutinized the spot. There was a join in the solid rock floor, and, great heavens, there, let in level with the rock, was a stone ring. We said no word. We were too excited, and our hearts beat too wildly with hope to allow us to speak. Good had a knife, at the back of which was one of those hooks that are made to extract stones from horses' hooves. He opened it and scratched round the ring with it. Finally he worked it under and levered away gently for fear of breaking the hook. The ring began to move. Being of stone, it had not rusted fast in all the centuries it had lain there, as would have been the case had it been of iron. Presently it was upright. Then he thrust his hands into it and tugged with all his force, but nothing budged. Let me try, I said impatiently, for the situation of the stone, right in the angle of the corner, was such that it was impossible for two to pull at once. I took hold and strained away, but no results. Then Sir Henry tried and failed. Taking the hook again, Good scratched all around the crack where we felt the air coming up. Now, Curtis, he said, tackle on and put your back into it. You are as strong as two. Stop. And he took off a stout black silk handkerchief, which, true to his habits of neatness, he still wore, and ran it through the ring. Quartermain, get Curtis round the middle and pull for dear life when I give the word. Now. Sir Henry put out all his enormous strength, and Good and I did the same, with such power as nature had given us. Heave! Heave! It's giving! gasped Sir Henry, and I heard the muscles of his great back cracking. Suddenly there was a grating sound, then a rush of air, and we were all on our backs on the floor with a heavy flagstone upon the top of us. Sir Henry's strength had done it, and never did muscular power stand a man in better stead. Light a match, Quartermain, he said, so soon as we had picked ourselves up and got our breath. Carefully now. I did so, and there before us, heaven be praised, was the first step of a stone stair. Now what is to be done? asked Good. Follow the stair, of course, and trust to Providence. Stop, said Sir Henry. Quartermain, get the bit of biltong and the water that are left. We may want them. I went, creeping back to our place by the chests for that purpose. And as I was coming away, an idea struck me. We had not thought much of the diamonds for the last twenty-four hours or so. Indeed, the very idea of diamonds was nauseous, seeing what they had entailed upon us. But, reflected I, I may as well pocket some, just in case we should ever get out of this ghastly hole. So I just put my fist into the first chest, and filled all the available pockets of my old shooting coat and trousers, topping up, this was a happy thought, with a few handfuls of big ones from the third chest. Also, by an afterthought, I stuffed Fulata's basket, which, except for one water gourd and a little biltong, was empty now with great quantities of the stones. I say, you fellows, I sang out, won't you take some diamonds with you? I filled my pockets and the basket. 
"'Oh, come on, Quartermain, and hang the diamonds,' said Sir Henry. "'I hope that I may never see another.' As for good, he made no answer. He was, I think, taking his last farewell of all that was left of the poor girl who had loved him so well. And curiously as it may seem to you, my reader, sitting at home at ease and reflecting on the vast, indeed the immeasurable, wealth which we were thus abandoning, I can assure you that if you had passed some twenty-eight hours with next to nothing to eat and drink in that place, you would not have cared to cumber yourself with diamonds whilst plunging down into the unknown bowels of the earth, in the wild hope of escape from an agonizing death. If from the habits of a lifetime it had not become a sort of second nature with me never to leave anything worth having behind, if there was the slightest chance of my being able to carry it away, I am sure that I should not have bothered to fill my pockets and that basket. "'Come on, Quartermain,' repeated Sir Henry, who was already standing on the first step of the stone stair. "'Steady, I will go first. "'Mind where you put your feet. "'There may be some awful hole underneath,' I answered. "'Much more likely to be another room,' said Sir Henry." while he descended slowly, counting the steps as he went. When he got to fifteen, he stopped. "'Here's the bottom,' he said. "'Thank goodness, I think it's a passage. Follow me down.' Good went next, and I came last, carrying the basket, and on reaching the bottom lit one of the two remaining matches. By its light we could just see that we were standing in a narrow tunnel, which ran right and left at right angles to the staircase we had descended. Before we could make out any more, the match burnt my fingers and went out. Then arose the delicate question of which way to go. Of course, it was impossible to know what the tunnel was or where it led to, and yet to turn one way might lead us to safety and the other to destruction. We were utterly perplexed, till suddenly it struck good that when I had lit the match, the draft of the passage blew the flame to the left. Let us go against the draft, he said. Air draws inwards, not outwards. We took this suggestion, and feeling along the wall with our hands, whilst trying the ground before us at every step, we departed from that accursed treasure chamber on our terrible quest for life. If ever it should be entered again by living man, which I do not think probable, he will find tokens of our visit in the open chests of jewels, the empty lamp, and the white bones of poor Fulata. When we had groped our way for about a quarter of an hour along the passage, suddenly it took a sharp turn, or else was bisected by another, which we followed only in course of time to be led into a third. And so it went on for some hours. We seemed to be in a stone labyrinth that led nowhere. What all these passages are, of course, I cannot say, but we thought that they must be the ancient workings of a mine, of which the various shafts and adits traveled hither and thither as the ore led them. This is the only way in which we could account for such a multitude of galleries. At length we halted, thoroughly worn out with fatigue, and with that hope deferred which maketh the heart sick, and ate up our poor remaining piece of biltong, and drank our last sup of water, for our throats were like lime kilns. It seemed to us that we had escaped death in the darkness of the treasure chamber, only to meet him in the darkness of the tunnels. As we stood, once more utterly depressed, I thought that I caught a sound, to which I call the attention of the others. It was very faint and very far off, but it was a sound, a faint murmuring sound, for the others heard it too, and no words can describe the blessedness of it after all those hours of utter awful stillness. 
"'By heavens, it's running water,' said Good. "'Come on!' "'Off we started again in the direction from which the faint murmur seemed to come, "'groping our way as before along the rocky walls. "'I remember that I laid down the basket full of diamonds, "'wishing to be rid of its weight, "'but on second thoughts took it up again. "'One might as well die rich as poor,' I reflected.' As we went, the sound became more and more audible, till at last it seemed quite loud in the quiet. On, yet on, now we could distinctly make out the unmistakable swirl of rushing water. And yet, how could there be running water in the bowels of the earth? Now we were quite near it, and Good, who was leading, swore that he could smell it. Go gently, Good said sir henry we must be close splash and a cry from good he had fallen in good good where are you we shouted in terrified distress to our intense relief an answer came back in a choky voice all right i've got hold of a rock strike a light to show me where you are hastily i lit the last remaining match its faint gleam discovered to us a dark mass of water running at our feet. How wide it was we could not see, but there some way out was the dark form of our companion hanging on to a projecting rock. Stand clear to catch me, swung out good. I must swim for it. Then we heard a splash and a great struggle. Another minute and he had grabbed at and caught Sir Henry's outstretched hand and we had pulled him up high and dry into the tunnel. "'My word!' he said between his gasps. "'That was touch and go. "'If I hadn't managed to catch that rock and know how to swim, "'I should have been done. "'It runs like a mill race, and I could feel no bottom.' "'We dared not follow the banks of the subterranean river "'for fear lest we should fall into it again in the darkness. "'So after Good had rested a while, and we had drunk our fill of the water, which was sweet and fresh, and washed our faces, that needed it sadly, as well as we could, we started from the banks of this African Styx, and began to retrace our steps along the tunnel, good dripping unpleasantly in front of us. At length we came to another gallery leading to our right. We may as well take it, said Sir Henry wearily, all roads are alike here. We can only go on till we drop. Slowly, for a long, long while, we stumbled, utterly exhausted, along this new tunnel, Sir Henry now leading the way. Again I thought of abandoning that basket, but did not. Suddenly he stopped, and we bumped up against him. Look, he whispered, is my brain going, or is that light? We stared with all our eyes, and there, yes, there, far ahead of us, was a faint, glimmering spot no larger than a cottage window pane. It was so faint that I doubt if any eyes, except those which, like ours, had for days seen nothing but blackness, could have perceived it at all. With a gasp of hope we pushed on. In five minutes there was no longer any doubt. It was a patch of faint light. A minute more, and a breath of real live air was fanning us. On we struggled. All at once the tunnel narrowed. Sir Henry went on his knees. Smaller yet it grew, till it was only the size of a large fox's earth. It was earth now, mind you. The rock had ceased. A squeeze, a struggle, and Sir Henry was out, and so was Good, and so was I, dragging Fulata's basket after me. And there above us were the blessed stars, and in our nostrils was the sweet air. Then suddenly something gave, and we were all rolling over and over and over through grass and bushes and soft, wet soil. The basket caught in something, and I stopped. Sitting up, I hallooed lustily. An answering shout came from below, where Sir Henry's wild career had been checked by some level ground. 
I scrambled to him and found him unhurt, though breathless. Then we looked for good. A little way off, we discovered him also, hammed in a forked root. He was a good deal knocked about, but soon came to himself. We sat down together there on the grass, and the revulsion of feeling was so great that really I think we cried with joy. We had escaped from that awful dungeon, which was so near to becoming our grave. Surely some merciful power guided our footsteps to the jackal hole, for that is what it must have been at the termination of the tunnel. And see, yonder on the mountains, the dawn we had never thought to look upon again was blushing rosy red. Presently the gray light stole down the slopes, and we saw that we were at the bottom, or rather nearly at the bottom, of the vast pit in front of the entrance to the cave. Now we could make out the dim forms of the three colossi who sat upon its verge. Doubtless those awful passages, along which we had wandered the live-long night, had been originally in some way connected with the great diamond mine. As for the subterranean river in the bowels of the mountain, heaven only knows what it is, or whence it flows, or whither it goes. I, for one, have no anxiety to trace its course. Lighter it grew, and lighter yet. We could see each other now, and such a spectacle as we presented I have never set eyes upon before or since. Gaunt-cheeked, hollow-eyed wretches, smeared all over with dust and mud, bruised, bleeding, the long fear of imminent death yet written on our countenances, we were indeed a sight to frighten the daylight. And yet it is a solemn fact that Good's eyeglass was still fixed in Good's eye. I doubt whether he had taken it out at all. Neither the darkness nor the plunge in the subterranean river nor the roll down the slope had been able to separate Good and his eyeglass. Presently we rose, feeling that our limbs would stiffen if we stopped there long, and commenced with slow and painful steps to struggle up the sloping sides of the great pit. For an hour or more we toiled steadfastly up the blue clay, dragging ourselves on by the help of the roots and grasses with which it was closed. But now I had no more thought of leaving the basket. Indeed, nothing but death should have parted us. At last it was done, and we stood by the great road on that side of the pit, which is opposite to the Colossi. At the side of the road, a hundred yards off, a fire was burning in front of some huts, and round the fire were figures. We staggered towards them, supporting one another, and halting every few paces. Presently one of the figures rose, saw us, and fell onto the ground, crying out for fear. Infarus, Infarus, it is we, thy friends. He rose, he ran to us, staring wildly, and still shaking with fear. O oh, my lords, my lords, it is you indeed. You come back from the dead, come back from the dead. And the old warrior flung himself down before us, and clasping Sir Henry's knees, he wept aloud for joy. End of chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information... And to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 19 Ignosi's Farewell Ten days from that eventful morning found us once more in our old quarters at Loo, and strange to say, but little the worse for our terrible experience, except that my stubby hair came out of the treasure cave about three shades grayer than it went in, 
and that good never was quite the same after Fulata's death, which seemed to move him very greatly. I am bound to say, looking at the thing from the point of view of an oldish man of the world, that I consider her removal was a fortunate occurrence, since otherwise complications would have been sure to ensue. The poor creature was no ordinary native girl, but a person of great, I had almost said stately, beauty, and of considerable refinement of mind. But no amount of beauty or refinement could have made an entanglement between good and herself a desirable occurrence, for, as she herself put it, can the sun mate with the darkness, or the white with the black. I need hardly state that we never again penetrated into Solomon's treasure chamber. After we had recovered from our fatigue, a process which took us 48 hours, we descended into the great pit in the hope of finding the hole by which we had crept out of the mountain, but with no success. To begin with, rain had fallen and obliterated our spore. And what is more, the sides of the vast pit were full of ant bear and other holes. It was impossible to say to which of these we owed our salvation. Also, on the day before we started back to Lou, we made a further examination of the wonders of the stalactite cave, and drawn by a kind of restless feeling, even penetrated once more into the chamber of the dead. Passing beneath the spear of the white death, we gazed with sensations which it would be quite impossible for me to describe at the mass of rock that had shut us off from escape, thinking the while of priceless treasures beyond, of the mysterious old hag whose flattened fragments lay crushed beneath it, and of the fair girl of whose tomb it was the portal. I say gazed at the rock, for examine as we could, we could find no traces of the join of the sliding door, nor indeed could we hit upon the secret, now utterly lost, that worked it, though we tried for an hour or more. It is certainly a marvelous bit of mechanism, characteristic in its massive and yet inscrutable simplicity of the age which produced it and I doubt if the world has such another to show. At last we gave it up in disgust, though if the mass had suddenly risen before our eyes, I doubt if we should have screwed up courage to step over Gagool's mangled remains and once more enter the treasure chamber, even in the sure and certain hope of unlimited diamonds. And yet I could have cried at the idea of leaving all that treasure, the biggest treasure probably that in the world's history has ever been accumulated in one spot. But there was no help for it. Only dynamite could force its way through five feet of solid rock. So we left it. Perhaps in some remote unborn century a more fortunate explorer may hit upon the open sesame and flood the world with gems. But myself, I doubt it. Somehow, I seem to feel that the tens of millions of pounds worth of jewels which lie in the three stone coffers will never shine round the neck of an earthly beauty. They and Fulata's bones will keep cold company till the end of all things. With a sigh of disappointment, we made our way back, and next day started for Lou. And yet it was really very ungrateful of us to be disappointed, for as the reader will remember, by a lucky thought, I had taken the precaution to fill the wide pockets of my old shooting coat and trousers with gems before we left our prison house, also Fulata's basket, which held twice as many more notwithstanding that the water bottle had occupied some of its space. A good many of these fell out in the course of our roll down the side of the pit, including several of the big ones, which I had crammed in on the top in my coat pockets. 
but comparatively speaking an enormous quantity still remained, including 93 large stones ranging from over 200 to 70 carats in weight. My old shooting coat and the basket still held sufficient treasure to make us all, if not millionaires, as the term is understood in America, at least exceedingly wealthy men, and yet to keep enough stones each to make the three finest sets of gems in Europe. So we had not done so badly. On arriving at Lou, we were most cordially received by Ignosi, whom we found well and busily engaged in consolidating his power and reorganizing the regiments which had suffered most in the great struggle with Twala. He listened with intense interest to our wonderful story. But when we told him of old Gagool's frightful end, he grew thoughtful. Come hither, he called to a very old Induna or counselor, who was sitting with others in a circle round the king, but out of earshot. The ancient man rose, approached, saluted, and seated himself. "'Thou art aged,' said Ignosi. "'I, my lord, the king, thy father's father, and I were born on the same day. "'Tell me, when thou wast little, did thou knowest Gagool, the witch-doctress? "'I, my lord, the king. "'How was she then, young like thee? "'Not so, my lord, the king. "'She was even as she is now.' as she was in the days of my great-grandfather before me, old and dried, very ugly, and full of wickedness. She is no more. She is dead. So, O king, then is an ancient curse taken from the land. Go. Cum, I go, black puppy, who tore out the old dog's throat. Whom? Ye see, my brothers, said Ignosi, this was a strange woman, and I rejoice that she is dead. She would have let you die in the dark place, and mayhap afterwards she had found a way to slay me, as she found a way to slay my father, and set up Twala, whom her black heart loved, in his place. Now go on with the tale. Surely there never was its like. After I had narrated all the story of our escape, as we had agreed between ourselves that I should, I took the opportunity to address Ignosi as to our departure from Kukuana land. And now, Ignosi, I said, the time has come for us to bid thee farewell and start to see our own land once more. Behold, Ignosi, thou camest with us a servant, and now we leave thee a mighty king. If thou art grateful to us, remember to do even as thou didst promise, to rule justly, to respect the law, and to put none to death without a cause. So shalt thou prosper. Tomorrow, at the break of day, Ignosi, Thou wilt give us an escort who shall lead us across the mountains. Is it not so, O king? Ignosi covered his face with his hands for a while before answering. My heart is sore, he said at last. Your words split my heart in twain. What have I done to you, Inkubu, Makumazan, and Buguan? that ye should leave me desolate, ye who stood by me in rebellion and in battle. Will ye leave me in the day of peace and victory? What will ye, wives? Choose from among the maidens. A place to live in? Behold, the land is yours as far as ye can see. The white men's houses? You shall teach my people how to build them. Cattle for beef and milk? Every married man shall bring you an ox or a cow. 
wild game to hunt? Does not the elephant walk through my forests, and the river horse sleep in the reeds? Would ye make war? My impies wait your word. If there is anything more which I can give, that will I give you. Nay, Ignosi, we want none of these things, I answered. We would seek our own place. Now do I learn, said Ignosi bitterly and with flashing eyes, that ye love the bright stones more than me, your friend. Ye have the stones, now ye would go to Natal and across the moving black water and sell them and be rich as it is the desire of a white man's heart to be. Cursed for your sake be the white stones, and cursed he who seeks them. Death shall it be to him who sets foot in the place of death to find them. I have spoken. White men, ye can go. I laid my hand upon his arm. Ignosi, I said, Tell us, when thou didst wander in Zululand and among the white people of Natal, did not thine heart turn to the land thy mother told thee of, thy native place, where thou didst see the light, and play when thou wast little, the land where thy place was? It was even so, Macumazahn. In like manner, Ignosi, do our hearts turn to our land and to our own place. Then came a silence. When Ignosi broke it, it was in a different voice. I do perceive that now as ever thy words are wise and full of reason, Macumazan. That which flies in the air loves not to run along the ground. The white man loves not to live on the level of the black, or to house among his corrals. Well, ye must go, and leave my heart sore, because ye will be as dead to me, since from where ye are no tidings can come to me. But listen, and let all your brothers know my words. No other white man shall cross the mountains even if any man live to come so far. I will see no traitors with their guns and gin. My people shall fight with the spear and drink water like their forefathers before them. I will have no praying men to put a fear of death into men's hearts, to stir them up against the law of the king and make a path for the white folk who follow to run on. If a white man comes to my gates, I will send him back. If a hundred come, I will push them back. If armies come, I will make war on them with all my strength, and they shall not prevail against me. None shall ever seek for the shining stones, no, not an army. For if they come, I will send a regiment and fill up the pit and break down the white columns in the caves, and choke them with rocks, so that none can reach even to that door of which ye speak, and whereof the way to move it is lost. But for you three, Inkabu, Makumazan, and Buguan, the path is always open, for behold, ye are nearer to me than aught that breathes, and ye would go. Infarus, my uncle, and my Unduna shall take you by the hand and guide you with a regiment. There is, as I have learned, another way across the mountains that he shall show you. Farewell, my brothers, brave white men. See me no more, for I have no heart to bear it. Behold, I make a decree, and it shall be published from the mountains to the mountains. Your names... Inkabu, Makumazan, and Buguan shall be Hlonipa, even as the names of dead kings, and he who speaks them shall die. So shall your memory be preserved in the land forever. Note, 
this extraordinary and negative way of showing intense respect is by no means unknown among African people, and the result is that if, as is usual, the name in question has a significance, the meaning must be expressed by an idiom or other word. In this way, a memory is preserved for generations, or until the new word utterly supplants the old. Go now, ere my eyes rain tears like a woman's. At times, as you look back down the path of life, or when you are old and gather yourselves together to crouch before the fire, because for you the sun has no more heat, ye will think of how we stood shoulder to shoulder in that great battle which thy wise words planned, Macumazahn, of how thou wast the point of the horn that galled Twala's flank, Buguan, whilst thou stood in the ring of the greys, Inkubu, and men went down before thine axe like corn before a sickle. Aye, and of how thou didst break that wild bull Twala's strength, and bring his pride to dust. Fare ye well forever, Inkibu, Macumazan, and Buguan, my lords and my friends. Ignosi rose and looked earnestly at us for a few seconds. Then he threw the corner of his cross over his head, so as to cover his face from us. We went in silence. Next day at dawn we left Lou, escorted by our old friend Infadus, who was heartbroken at our departure, and by the regiment of buffaloes. Early as was the hour, all the main street of the town was lined with multitudes of people who gave us the royal salute as we passed at the head of the regiment, while the women blessed us for having rid the land of Twala, throwing flowers before us as we went. It was really very affecting, and not the sort of thing one is accustomed to meet with from natives. One ludicrous incident occurred, however, which I rather welcomed, as it gave us something to laugh at. Just before we reached the confines of the town, a pretty young girl with some lovely lilies in her hand ran forward and presented them to Good. Somehow they all seemed to like Good. I think his eyeglass and solitary whisker gave him a fictitious value. And then said that she had a boon to ask. Speak on, he answered. Let my lord show his servant his beautiful white legs, that his servant may look upon them and remember them all her days, and tell of them to her children. His servant has traveled four days' journey to see them, for the fame of them has gone throughout the land. I'll be hanged if I do, exclaimed Good excitedly. Come, come, my dear fellow, said Sir Henry. You can't refuse to oblige a lady. I won't, replied Good obstinately. It is positively indecent. However, in the end, he consented to drop his trousers to the knee, amid notes of rapturous admiration from all the women present, especially the gratified young lady. And in this guise he had to walk till we got clear of the town, Good's legs, I fear, will never be so greatly admired again. Of his melting teeth, and even of his transparent eye, the Kukuanas wearied more or less, but of his legs, never. As we traveled, Infidus told us that there was another pass over the mountains to the north of the one followed by Solomon's Great Road, or rather, that there was a place where it was possible to climb down the wall of cliff which separates Kukuana land from the desert, and is broken by the towering shapes of Sheba's breasts. It appeared also that rather more than two years previously, a party of Kukuana hunters had descended this path into the desert in search of ostriches, whose plumes are much prized among them for war headdresses, and that in the course of their hunt they had been led far from the mountains and were much troubled by thirst. Seeing trees on the horizon, however, they walked towards them, and discovered a large and fertile oasis some miles in extent, and plentifully watered. 
It was by way of this oasis that Infidus suggested we should return, and the idea seemed to us a good one, for it appeared that we should thus escape the rigors of the mountain pass. Also some of the hunters were in attendance to guide us to the oasis, from which they stated they could perceive other fertile spots far away in the desert. Note, it often puzzled all of us to understand how it was possible that Ignosi's mother, bearing the child with her, should have survived the dangers of her journey across the mountains and the desert, dangers which so nearly proved fatal to ourselves. It has since occurred to me, and I give the idea to the reader for what it is worth, that she must have taken this second route, and wandered out like Hagar into the wilderness. If she did so, there is no longer anything inexplicable about the story, since, as Ignosi himself related, she may well have been picked up by some ostrich hunters before she or the child was exhausted, was led by them to the oasis, and thence by stages to the fertile country, and so on by slow degrees southwards to Zululand. Alan Quartermain. Traveling easily, on the night of the fourth day's journey, we found ourselves once more on the crest of the mountains that separate Kukuana land from the desert, which rolled away in sandy billows at our feet, and about twenty-five miles to the north of Sheba's breasts. At dawn on the following day, we were led to the edge of a very precipitous chasm by which we were to descend the precipice and gain the plain two thousand and more feet below. Here we bade farewell to that true friend and sturdy old warrior, Infadus, who solemnly wished all good upon us and nearly wept with grief. Never, my lords, he said, shall mine own eyes see the like of you again. Ah, the way that Inkabu cut his men down in the battle. Ah, for the sight of that stroke with which he swept off my brother Twala's head. It was beautiful, beautiful. I may never hope to see such another, except, perchance, in happy dreams. We were very sorry to part from him. Indeed, Good was so moved that he gave him as a souvenir, what do you think, an eyeglass. Afterwards we discovered that it was a spare one. Infidus was delighted, foreseeing that the possession of such an article would increase his prestige enormously, and after several vain attempts he actually succeeded in screwing it into his own eye. Anything more incongruous than the old warrior looked with an eyeglass I never saw. Eyeglasses do not go well with leopard skin cloaks and black ostrich plumes, then, after seeing that our guides were well laden with water and provisions, and having received a thundering farewell salute from the buffaloes, we wrung Infadus by the hand and began our downward climb. A very arduous business it proved to be, but somehow that evening we found ourselves at the bottom without accident. Do you know, said Sir Henry that night, as we sat by our fire and gazed up at the beetling cliffs above us. I think that there are worse places than Kukuana land in the world, and that I have known unhappier times than the last month or two, though I have never spent such queer ones. Eh, you fellows? I almost wish I were black, said Good with a sigh. As for myself, I reflected that all's well that ends well, but in the course of a long life of shaves, I never had such shaves as those which I recently experienced. The thought of that battle makes me feel cold all over, and as for our experience in the treasure chamber. Next morning, we started on a toilsome trudge across the desert, having with us a good supply of water carried by our five guides, and camped that night in the open, marching again at dawn on the morrow. By noon of the third day's journey we could see the trees of the oasis of which the guide spoke, and within an hour of sundown we were walking once more upon grass and listening to the sound of running water. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 20 Found And now I come to perhaps the strangest adventure that happened to us in all this strange business, and one which shows how wonderfully things are brought about. I was walking along quietly, some way in front of the other two, down the banks of the stream which runs from the oasis till it is swallowed up in the hungry desert sands, when suddenly I stopped and rubbed my eyes as well I might. There, not twenty yards in front of me, placed in a charming situation under the shade of a species of fig tree, and facing to the stream, was a cozy hut, built more or less on the Kaffir principle, with grass and withes, but having a full-length door instead of a bee-hole. What the dickens, said I to myself, can a hut be doing out here? Even as I said it, the door of the hut opened, and there limped out of it a white man clothed in skins, and with an enormous black beard. I thought that I must have got a touch of the sun. It was impossible. No hunter ever came to such a place as this. Certainly no hunter would ever settle in it. I stared and stared, and so did the other man, and just at that juncture Sir Henry and Good walked up. "'Look here, you fellows,' I said. "'Is that a white man, or am I mad?' "'Sir Henry looked, and Good looked, "'and then all of a sudden the lame white man with a black beard "'uttered a great cry and began hobbling towards us. "'When he was close, he fell down in a sort of faint. "'With a spring, Sir Henry was by his side. "'Great powers!' he cried. "'It is my brother George!' At the sound of this disturbance, another figure, also clad in skins, emerged from the hut, a gun in his hand, and ran towards us. On seeing me, he too gave a cry. Makuma's on, he hollowed. Don't you know me, boss? I'm Jim the Hunter. I lost the note you gave me to give to the boss, and we have been here nearly two years. And the fellow fell at my feet and rolled over and over, weeping for joy. "'You careless scoundrel,' I said. "'You ought to be well jambocked. "'That is, hided. "'Meanwhile, the man with the black beard had recovered and risen, "'and he and Sir Henry were pump-handing away at each other, "'apparently without a word to say. "'But whatever they had quarreled about in the past, "'I suspect it was a lady, though I never asked. "'It was evidently forgotten now.' "'My dear old fellow,' burst out Sir Henry at last. "'I thought you were dead. "'I have been over Solomon's Mountains to find you. "'I had given up all hope of ever seeing you again, "'and now I come across you perched in the desert "'like an old Asfogel. Vulture. "'I tried to cross Solomon's Mountains nearly two years ago,' was the answer, spoken in the hesitating voice of a man who has had little recent opportunity of using his tongue. "'But when I reached here, a boulder fell on my leg and crushed it, "'and I have been able to go neither forward nor back. "'Then I came up. "'How do you do, Mr. Neville?' I said. "'Do you remember me?' "'Why,' he said, "'isn't it Hunter Quartermain, eh? "'And good, too. "'Hold on a minute, you fellows. "'I'm getting dizzy again. "'It is all so very strange, "'and when a man has ceased to hope, "'so very happy.' "'That evening, over the campfire, "'George Curtis told us his story, "'which in its way was almost as eventful as our own, "'and put shortly amounted to this.' A little less than two years before, he had started from Sitanda's corral to try and reach Suleiman's burg. As for the note I had sent him by Jim, 
that worthy lost it, and he had never heard of it till today. But acting upon information he had received from the natives, he headed not for Sheba's breasts, but for the ladder-like descent of the mountains down which we had just come, which is clearly a better route than that marked out in old Dom Silvestre's plan. In the desert, he and Jim had suffered great hardships, but finally they reached this oasis, where a terrible accident befell George Curtis. On the day of their arrival, he was sitting by the stream, and Jim was extracting the honey from the nest of a stingless bee, which is to be found in the desert, on the top of a bank immediately above him. In so doing, he loosened a great boulder of rock, which fell upon George Curtis's right leg, crushing it frightfully. From that day he had been so lame that he found it impossible to go either forward or back, and had preferred to take the chance of dying in the oasis to the certainty of perishing in the desert. As for food, however, they got on pretty well, for they had a good supply of ammunition, and the oasis was frequented, especially at night, by large quantities of game, which came thither for water. These they shot, or trapped in pitfalls, using the flesh for food, and after their clothes wore out, the hides for clothing. And so, George Curtis ended, we have lived for nearly two years, like a second Robinson Crusoe and his man Friday, hoping against hope that some natives might come here to help us away, but none have come. Only last night we settled that Jim should leave me and try to reach Sitanda's corral to get assistance. He was to go tomorrow, but I had little hope of ever seeing him back again. And now you, of all people in the world, you, who, as I fancied, had long ago forgotten all about me and were living comfortably in old England, turn up in a promiscuous way and find me where you least expected. It is the most wonderful thing that I have ever heard of, and the most merciful, too. Then Sir Henry sat to work and told him the main facts of our adventures, sitting till late into the night to do it. By Jove, said George Curtis, when I showed him some of the diamonds. Well, at least you have got something for your pains besides my worthless self. Sir Henry laughed. They belong to Quartermain and good. It was a part of the bargain that they should divide any spoils there might be. This remark set me thinking, and having spoken to Good, I told Sir Henry that it was our joint wish that he should take a third portion of the diamonds, or, if he would not, that his share should be handed to his brother, who had suffered even more than ourselves on the chance of getting them. Finally, we prevailed upon him to consent to this arrangement, but George Curtis did not know of it until some time afterwards. Here at this point I think I shall end my history. Our journey across the desert back to Sitanda's corral was most arduous, especially as we had to support George Curtis, whose right leg was very weak indeed, and continually threw out splinters of bone. But we did accomplish it somehow, and to give its details would only be to reproduce much of what happened to us on the former occasion. Six months from the date of our re-arrival at Sitanda's, where we found our guns and other goods quite safe, though the old rascal in charge was much disgusted at our surviving to claim them, saw us all once more safe and sound at my little place on the Berea, near Durban, where I am now writing. Thence I bid farewell to all who have accompanied me through the strangest trip I ever made in the course of a long and varied experience. P.S. Just as I had written the last word, a kaffir came up my avenue of orange trees, carrying a letter in a cleft stick, which he had brought from the post. It turned out to be from Sir Henry, and as it speaks for itself, I give it in full. October 1, 1884, Braley Hall, Yorkshire. 
My dear Quartermain, I send you a line a few mails back to say that the three of us, Good, George, and myself, fetched up all right in England. We got off the boat at Southampton and went up to town. You should have seen what a swell Good turned out to be the very next day, beautifully shaved, frock coat fitting like a glove, brand new eyeglass, etc., etc. I went and walked in the park with him, where I met some people I know, and at once told him the story of his beautiful white legs. He is furious, especially as some ill-natured person has printed it in a society paper. To come to business, Good and I took the diamonds to Streeter's, to be valued as we arranged, and really I am afraid to tell you what they put them at. It seems so enormous. They say that, of course, it is more or less guesswork, as such stones have never to their knowledge been put on the market in anything like such quantities. It appears that with the exception of one or two of the largest, they are of the finest water, and equal in every way to the best Brazilian stones. I asked them if they would buy them, but they said it was beyond their power to do so, and recommended us to sell by degrees over a period of years, indeed, for fear lest we should flood the market. They offer, however, a hundred and eighty thousand for a very small portion of them. You must come home, Quartermain, and see about these things, especially if you insist upon making the magnificent present of the third share, which does not belong to me, to my brother George. As for good, he is no good. His time is too much occupied in shaving, and other matters connected with the vain adorning of the body. But I think he is still down on his luck about Fulata. He told me that since he had been home, he hadn't seen a woman to touch her, either as regards her figure or the sweetness of her expression. I want you to come home, my dear old comrade, and to buy a house near here. You have done your day's work, and have lots of money now, and there is a place for sale quite close which would suit you admirably. Do come, the sooner the better. You can finish writing the story of our adventures on board ship. We have refused to tell the tale till it is written by you, for fear lest we shall not be believed. If you start on receipt of this, you will reach here by Christmas, and I book you to stay with me for that. Good is coming, and George, and so, by the way, is your boy Harry. There's a bribe for you. I have had him down for a week's shooting, and like him. He's a cool young hand. He shot me in the leg, cut out the pellets, and then remarked upon the advantages of having a medical student with every shooting party. Goodbye, old boy. I can't say any more. But I know that you will come, if it is only to oblige your sincerest friend, Henry Curtis. P.S. The tusks of the great bull that killed poor Kiva have now been put up in the hall here, over the pair of buffalo horns you gave me, and look magnificent. And the axe with which I chopped off Twala's head is fixed above my writing table. I wish that we could have managed to bring away the coats of chain armor. Don't lose poor Fulata's basket in which you brought away the diamonds. H.C. Today is Tuesday. There is a steamer going on Friday. And I really think that I must take Curtis at his word and sail by her for England. If it is only to see you, Harry, my boy, and to look after the printing of this history which is a task that I do not like to trust to anybody else. Alan Quartermain The End <laughs>